Greetings and salutations, dear viewers. It is I, Ultra of Toro Productions, and as you could tell by the title, it's that time of year again. Spooktober story time. And I decided, in commemoration of the release of the Five Nights at Freddy's movie, this year's Spooktober story time is all about FNAF. And so, let us begin with our first story, Count the Ways, as read by Gravity Without Context. Why, it isn't Billy Fitzsimmons! A deep, booming voice said in the darkness. It was hard to tell exactly where it was coming from but it felt like it was all around her. Silly Millie, chilly Millie, the ice cold goth girl, always dreaming of death. Am I right? Huh, who are you? Millie demanded. Where are you? Above her, a large pair of terrifying blue eyes rolled backwards looking down into the chamber. I'm right here, silly Millie. Or maybe I should say, you're right here. You're right inside my belly, in the belly of the beast. I guess you could say. So, you're the bear. Millie wondered if she had fallen asleep after she climbed inside the robot. She, if she was dreaming, this was all too weird. You can just think of me as a friend. Your friend till the end. We just have to decide if the end is going to be slow or quick. I, I don't understand. This space was starting to feel claustrophobic. She tried the door, didn't budge. You'll understand very soon, chilly Millie. Ah, oh, you goth girls crack me up. I'll dress like professional mourners. So serious all the time. Daydreaming about death. Like he's some lead singer in a boy band. And that when you meet him, it'll be love at first sight. Well, Merry Christmas, Billy. I'm going to make your dreams come true. It's not a question of if or how. What was happening? She was definitely awake. Had she lost her mind? Descended into madness like a character in an Edgar Allan Poe story? I, I, I'd like to get out now, she said. Her voice sounded small and shaky. Nonsense! The voice said. You're going to stay in here all nice and cozy. While we work out how you're going to have your dream with death. The choice is all yours. But it will be my pleasure to present you with some options. Options of how to die? Millie felt the cold metallic taste of fear the back of her throat. Fantasies about death were one thing, but this felt like reality. Millie. What a stupid name. She was named after her great-grandmother, Millicent Fitzsimmons. But Millie wasn't the type of name you settled to a person. A cat or a dog, maybe, but not an actual human. Millie's black cat was named Annabelle Lee after the beautiful dead girl in the Edgar Allan Poe poem. 
which meant that Millie's cat officially had a better name than she did. But, Millie thought it made sense that her parents would come up with such a ridiculous name. She, she loved them, but they were ridiculous people in a lot of ways. Flighty and impractical. The kind of people who would never think how hard elementary school would be for an, a little girl whose name rhymed with silly. Her parents flitted from job to job, from hobby to hobby, and now it seemed from country to country. Over the summer, Millie's dad had been offered one year teaching job in Saudi Arabia. Her mom and dad had given her a choice. She could go with them. It'll be an adventure, her mom kept saying, and be homeschooled. Or she could move in with her kooky grandpa for a year and start at the local high school. Talk about a lose-lose situation. After lots of crying and raging and sulking, Millie had finally chosen the kooky grandpa option over being stranded in a foreign country with her well-meaning but unreliable parents. And so now, Millie was here in her strange little room in Grandpa's big, strange Victorian house. She had to admit, the idea of living in an old, sprawling 150-year-old house for surely someone had to have died at some point suited her well enough. The only problem was that it was filled to the brim with her grandparents' junk. Millie's grandpa was a collector. Lots of people have collections, of course, comic books, or gaming cards, or action figures. But Grandpa didn't collect a specific type of thing so much as accumulate a lot of different things. He was definitely a collector, but a collector of what? Millie wasn't sure. It all seemed very random. Looking around the living room, she could see old license plates and hubcaps hanging on one wall, old baseball bats and tennis rackets on another. A life-size suit of armor stood guard at one side of the front of the door, and a mangy-looking taxidermy bobcat stood at the other side, its mouth open and fangs bared in a menacing fashion. One glass case in the living room contained nothing but old porcelain baby dolls with tiny teeth and staring glass eyes. They were creepy, and Millie tried to stay away from them, though they still showed up sometimes in her nightmares with those little teeth chomping at her. Her new bedroom had been her grandma's sewing room, and it contained the old sewing machine, even though her grandma had died before Millie was born. Grandpa had moved in a narrow bed and a dresser to accommodate Millie and her belongings. She had tried to make the room her own. She draped beside the bedside lamp with her sh sheer black lacy scarf so it gave off a muted glow. She covered the dresser with dripping candles, and she, she hung posters of Kurt Carrion, her favorite singer, on the walls. In one poster, the cover design for his album, Rigor Mortis, Kurt's lips were peeled back to re reveal a set of metal fangs, a perfect red be bead of blood glistened on his chin. The trouble was, though, that no matter how much Millie tried to match the room's decor to her personality, it never quite worked. The sewing machine was there, and the wallpaper was cream-colored and decorated with tiny pink rosebuds. 
Even with Kurt Carrion's fanged face gl glowering on the wall, there was something about the room that seemed sweet and old lady-ish. Soup's on! Grandpa called from the bottom of the stairs. This was how he always announced dinner, and yet he had never once served soup. I'll be there in a minute, Millie yelled back, not really caring whether she ate dinner or not. She dragged herself off the bed and made her way downstairs, slowly, trying not to bump or trip into any of the clutter that seemed to fill every square inch of space in the house. Lee met Grandpa in the dining room, where the walls were decorated with souvenir plates printed with the names and landmarks of different states he had visited with Grandma when she was alive. The opposite wall displayed replicas of antique swords. Billy wasn't sure what those were about. Grandpa was every bit of as weird as his collections. His wispy gray hair was always messy and wild. And he always wore the same ratty tan cardigan. He looked like he could play a wacky inventor in an old movie. Dinner is served, madame. Grandpa said, setting a bowl of mashed potatoes on the table. Millie sat at her place at the table and surveyed the visually disgusting meal. Mushy-looking meatloaf, instant mashed potatoes, and creamed spinach that she knew had been packaged and frozen in a solid block until Grandpa zapped it in the microwave. It was a meal you could eat even if you didn't have teeth. Which Millie supposed went with the territory having an old person cook for you. Millie loaded her plate with mashed potatoes since they were the only edible thing at the table. Now make sure you get some meatloaf and spinach too, Grandpa said, passing her a bowl of greens. You need iron. You always look so pale. I like being pale. Millie wore a sheer light powder to make her face look even paler in contrast to the black eyeliner and black clothing she favored. Well, Grandpa said, helping himself to meatloaf. I'm glad you don't bake yourself in the sun like your mother did when she was your age. Still, you could use a little color on your cheeks. He held out a platter of meatloaf to her. You know I don't eat meat, Grandpa. Meat is gross. And also murder. Eat some spinach, then. Grandpa said, spooning some on her plates. Plenty of iron in it. You know, back when I learned a little bit of cooking... I can ma manage. It was about, about meat, meatloaf, steaks, roast beef, pork chops. But if you'll help me find some vegetarian recipes, I'll sure try to cook them for you. It would probably be better for my health to eat less meat anyway. Millie sighed and pushed the spinach around on her plates. Don't bother. It doesn't really matter whether I eat or not. Grandpa set down his fork. Of course it matters. Everybody's got to eat. He shook his head. There's no pleasing you, is there, girly? I'm trying to be nice and figure out what you like. I want to make you happy here. Millie pushed her plate away. It's a waste of energy to try to make me happy. I'm not a happy person. And you know what? I'm glad I'm not happy. Happy people are just lying to themselves. Well, if there's nothing in store for you, 
but in misery, I guess you might as well go get started on your homework. Grandpa said and ate his last bite of mashed potatoes. Mealy rolled her eyes and flounced out of the room. Homework was a misery. School was a misery. Her whole life was a misery. In her miserable room, Millie opened her laptop and searched for famous poems about death. She reread her old favorites, Annabelle Lee, the cat with the same name that was curled up on her bed, and The Raven by Poe. <sighs> then tried one she'd never seen before by Emily Dickinson. The poem talked about death as a guy picking up a girl for a date. A date with death. The thought made Millie lightheaded. She, she thought of death as a handsome, black-cloaked stranger choosing her as the one, one he would take away from this boredom and misery of everyday life. She imagined he looked like Kurt Carrion, ins inspired... She grabbed her black leather journal and began to write, Oh, death, show me your ravaged face. Oh, death, how I long for your chilly embrace. Oh, death, my life is such a misery. Then only you can set me free. She knew poems didn't have to rhyme, but Edgar Allan Poe and Emily Dickinson rhymes. So she rhymed her poem too. Not bad, she decided. Sighing with dread of what laid before her, she closed her journal and took out her homework. Algebra. What use was algebra in the face of human beings? Inevitable mortality? None. Well, None except that if you didn't pass all her classes, her parents would cut off the allowance that her grandpa doled out every week. And she was saving up for more jet morning droolery. She opened her algebra book and picked up her pencil and began. A few minutes later, there was a knock on the door. What? Millie snapped and slammed her book shut. As if she'd been interrupted doing something she actually enjoyed. Grandpa nudged the door open with his foot. He was carrying a glass of milk and a plate of fragrant chocolate chip cookies. I thought you might need a little study fuel, he said. I know chocolate always did the trick for me. Grandpa, I'm not a little kid anymore, Millie said. You can't buy my happiness with a few cookies. Okay, Grandpa said, still holding the plate. Want me to take them away then? No, Millie said quickly. Leave them. Grandpa shook his head, smiled a little, and set the plate and glass on Millie's bedside table. I'm going to putter around in my workshop for an hour or so, girly, he said. Call me if you need anything. I won't need anything, Millie said, turning back to her algebra homework. She waited until she was sure he was gone and then devoured the cookies. Options of how to die, exactly, the voice in the darkness said. Y you're catching on now, bright girl that you are. Now, I'd like to get called the first couple of options, the lazy choices. They don't require me to do anything, but keep you here. And let nature take its course. The advantage to these is that they're easy peasy for me. The 
and that's so easy for you. Slow for the lots and lots of suffering. But who knows? That might appeal to your morbid sensibilities. Lots of opportunities for languishing. You like languishing? What, what do you mean? Millie asked. Whatever the answer was, she knew she wasn't going to like it. Dehydration! Dehydration is one option! The voice said. No water at all! You can die in as many as three days! Or as many as seven! You're young and healthy! So I put my money on to taking you alive. Depriving the body of water has fascinating effects. With no fluids coming in, the filter and flush, the, the kidneys shut down, and your body starts poisoning itself, making you sicker and sicker. Once those poisons have time to build up, you can suffer total organ failure, or a heart attack, or stroke. But that's death for you. So glamorous. So romantic. Are you making fun of me? The voice that came out of Millie was tiny and soft. Voice of a scared little girl. Not at all, my dear. I like you, Lily, and that's why I'm here, to make your wishes come true, like a genie, except you're the one who's trapped in the bottle. The voice stopped to chuckle. That nation is another classic, too, but that's a slow-moving train. It takes weeks for the body to use up its stores of nutrition and break down all its proteins and turn on itself. It can take weeks. Some people have even lasted months. Millie knew her grandpa would rescue her before she could starve to death. That'll never work. Gra grandpa comes in here to put her around uh, after dinner every night, you'll find me. How? Voice asked. You'll hear me. I'll scream. Scream all you want, lamp chop. It's soundproof. No one will hear you. And anyway, after a few days, you'll be till we to scream. Winter break was just one week away, oh, and the whole school was decorated with wreaths, Christmas trees, and a, the occasional menorah. Millie didn't know why people got so excited over the holidays. Millie didn't know why people got so excited over the holidays. They were just a desperate attempt to invent some happiness in the face of life's utter meaninglessness. Well, they couldn't fool her. People could wish her Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays until they turned Santa Claus red in the face. But she wouldn't say it back. Not that people were going out of their way to wish Millie well. As she walked down the hall to the lunchroom, one blonde cheerleader, Millie didn't even know her name, said, I'm surprised to see you out in daylight, Dracula's daughter. The cheerleader looked over equal at her equally blonde friends, whom she'd been talking to more than she'd actually been talking to Millie. And they all laughed. The Dracula's daughter thing had started because she'd been carrying around a paperback copy of Bram Stoker's Dracula 
and one of the jockey popular guys had said, Oh look, how sweet, she's reading about her dad. From then on, she'd been Dracula's daughter. Everybody knew she was really Jeff and Audrey Fitzsimmons' daughter, which made her almost as much of a misfit as she would have been if Dracula really were her to add. The Fitzsimmons were the kind of a joke in the town, famous for their tendency to start projects with great enthusiasm and then abandon them. They had bought a rundown but once beautiful colonial house when Millie was 10 and then thrown themselves into refurbishing it. They had kept it up for about three months until they ran out of time, money, and energy. As a result, the house had a weird patchwork quality. The room and the kitchen were repainted and had new fixtures, but the bedroom still had old peeling wallpaper, and the floors were still squeaky, and the bathroom pipes screamed when you turned them on. The water and the ancient tub, sink, and toilet never looked clean, no matter how much they were scrubbed. The most talked about thing, though, was the exterior of the house. Millie's dad had repainted the front and one side a nice soft blue with green trim, but the paint was expensive and painting was exhausting and he really didn't like getting up on ladders. As a result, the front of the house was painted beautifully but the back and the other side were still covered in old, flaking white paint. Millie's mom said nobody would notice. It was like when people arranged the Christmas tree, so the ugly side faced the wall. People noticed. People also noticed the fit Simmons inability to keep a steady job. Millie's parents were always coming up with some new scheme that finally was going to bring them the success of their dreams. One year, her mom was making candles and selling them at farmer's markets, while her dad started a nutritional supplement store that closed its doors after six months. After that, her mom and dad started a store that sold yarn and knitting supplies. And they might have made a go of it if either of their parents had known more about yarn and knitting. And then they bought a food truck, even though they were both terrible cooks. Millie couldn't understand how her parents could remain so optimistic with failure after failure. But they did. They attacked each new project with huge enthusiasm, and then after a few months, both the project and the enthusiasm fizzled. They weren't poor, exactly. There, were all, there was always food on the table to eat, even if toward the end of the month, it tended to dwindle to pancake mix and box macaroni and cheese. But there was all always worry about the bills and how they were going to get paid. Millie knew that her grandpa helped them out some months. Her grandpa was also considered weird in the town, but was cut some slack because he was old and a widower and had been an excellent high school math teacher for many years. As a result, he earned the title of eccentric instead of weird. Some people said that maybe by taking this teaching job in Saudi Arabia, Jeff was finally gonna get it together and start following in his dad's footsteps. Millie knew, though, that her dad would fritter away this op opportunity like he had so many others. So Dracula's daughter 
or Jeff and Audrey Fitzsimmons' daughter. Either one was a one-way ticket to being a social outcast. In the cafeteria, Millie took a second to adjust to the deafening din of hundreds of teenagers talking and laughing. She walked past a table full of popular girls and saw her best friend from elementary school, Hannah, sitting with them, laughing at something all the other girls were laughing about. Millie and Hannah had been inseparable from kindergarten through fifth grade, playing on swings or jumping rope together at every recess and playing dolls or board games at each other's houses after school. But in middle school, popularity started to be more and more important to Hannah, and she drifted away from Millie and toward the crowd who was always giggling about clothes and boys. What Millie understood, but Hannah did not, was that those girls never accepted Hannah as more than a hanger-on. Hannah lived in a plain little house in a plain little neighborhood and didn't have the money or social status to make the cuts. The popular girls didn't push her away, but they never let her into their inner circle. It made Millie sad that Hannah preferred to accept crumbs from popular girls rather than a real friendship from her. But then, a lot of things made Millie sad. Millie sat alone, nibbling on her egg salad sandwich and apple slices her grandpa had packed her for lunch and reading Tales of Mystery and Imagination. She was managing to drown out the cafeteria noise and focus on the story. She was reading The Fall of the House of Usher, Roderick Usher. The main character in the story couldn't bear noise of any kind, but then she felt herself being watched. She looked up from her work to see a lanky boy with horn-rimmed glasses and frizzy hair that had been dyed fire engine red. Both his eyes were stubbed with silver earrings. Millie coveted his black leather jacket. Hi, um, I was wondering, he nodded at the chair across from Millie, is anyone sitting there? Was this guy asking to sit with her? Nobody asked to sit with her. My imaginary friends? Millie said. Wait, is that a joke? She never joked with people. The boy grinned, revealing a mouthful of braces. Well, would your imaginary friends mind if I sat in her lap? Millie looked at the empty chair for a second. She says, suit yourself. Okay, he said, setting his tray down. Thanks to both of you. I don't really know anybody yet. I'm new. Nice to meet you, new. I'm Millie. What? Was she a comedian now? My name's Dylan, actually. I just moved here from Toledo. He gestured towards her book. His fingernails were short but polished black. A Poe fan, huh? Millie nodded. Me too, Dylan said. And H.P. Lovecraft. I love all the scary writers. I never read Lovecraft, Millie said. Better to be honest than to try to fake knowledge and talk herself into a corner. I've heard of him, though. Oh, you'd love him, Dylan said, dunking a cafeteria-issued chicken nugget into a puddle of ketchup. Super dark and twisty, he looked around the cafeteria, his face in disdain. 
So, is this school as lame as it seems? Lamer, Millie said, marking her place in her book and shutting it. The House of Usher wasn't going anywhere, and she couldn't remember when she the last had an interesting conversation. Well, I'll tell you what, Dylan said, gesturing with a french fry. So far... You're the only person I've seen here who seems cool. Millie felt her face heating up. He hoped a blush wouldn't pink in her pallor. Thanks, and she said, I, uh, like your jacket. And I like your earrings. She reached up to touch one of the, the black teardrops that dangled from her, her earlobes. Thanks. Their Victorian morning jewelry. I know, Dylan said. He knew? What kind of high school guy knew about Victorian morning jewelry? I have a few pieces of it, Millie said. I mostly find them on eBay. I can't afford my favorite kind, though, which is Dylan put up his hand. Wait, wait, don't tell me. It's that kind where they weave the hair of the dead person into the jewelry, right? Yes! Millie said, shocked and amazed. Those pieces show up sometimes on eBay, but they always cost a fortune. The bell rang, signaling that lunch period was about to end. Dylan leaned towards Millie and half whispered, do not ask who whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee, Millie finished. Where had this guy come from? Toledo? Sure, but how was he so sophisticated and knowledgeable? She had never met anyone like him. Dylan stood up. Millie, it's been a rare pleasure. Would you and your imaginary friend mind very much if I joined you two at lunch tomorrow? Millie felt corners of her mouth twitch in an unfamiliar way. We wouldn't mind at all, she said. See, I thought about freezing you too, the voice said. I thought I could shut out the power in here so the space heater turns off and my metal body can get pretty cold. But I figured your grandpa would come in and notice the power's out in his precious workshop and would fix it right away. So freezing to death is a no-go. Sorry if you had your heart set on that one, sweet pea. Millie was shivering, not from the cold, but from fear. I... I don't understand. Why do you want to kill me? Interesting you should ask, the voice said. There are a couple of reasons, actually. The first is quite simply that it's something to do. I sat in a salvage yard for ages before your grandpa found me and brought me here. I've been sitting, too. I'm bored out of my endo skull. Not that I have a literal skull, but you know what I mean. Aren't there, aren't there other things you could find to do besides killing people? Billy asked. Whatever this being was, it was obviously intelligent. Maybe she could reason with it. None so interesting. And plus, that's my second reason. Which is that death is what you want. You've been moaning about it since you moved here. Talking about how much you want to die. Well, I like to kill people. And you want to die. It's a mutually beneficial relationship. Like those little birds that pick at the parasites off the rhinoceros. The bird gets to eat, 
the rhinoceros gets rid of the itchy little box. We both get what we want. Win-win. Millie suddenly realized that she had spoken of death, written about it, but it had always been just an interesting idea to play around with. She never intended to take any action to make it a reality. But, but I don't want to die. Not really. Horrible rumbling sounds surrounded Millie and shook the body of the machine that trapped her. It took her a few seconds to re realize it was the sound of laughter. For dinner, Grandpa made spaghetti with marinara sauce, garlic bread, and Caesar salad. Much better than the meals he usually slung together. You're actually eating tonight, Grandpa said. Because this is really good, Millie said, twirling spaghetti on her fork. All right, I finally found something you like to eat, Grandpa said. I'll add it to my limited repertoire. I kept the sauce meatless for you and added meatballs to mine, so everyone's happy. Herbivores and carnivores alike. Well, happy may be stretching it, Millie said, unwilling to admit that she actually had a kind of a good day. But spaghetti is good, and my day didn't totally stink. And what made the day less stinky than as usual? Grandpa asked, spearing meatball. I met someone who seems kind of cool. Really? A girl? Someone? Or a boy? Someone. Billy didn't like Grandpa's insinuating tone. Well, not that it matters, but it happens to be a boy. Don't try to turn it into one of those kind of love stories, though. We just had a decent conversation, is all. A decent conversation is something especially these days most people the age won't look up from their own phones long enough to say as much as how do you do, Grandpa said. Not to put the cart before the horse, but I met your grandma when I was just a little older than you are now. So what? Now you have me engaged to this guy I just met? Grandpa, I'm 14. Grandpa laughed. You're right that you're t much too young to be engaged. And your grandma and I didn't get engaged in when we were teenagers either. But we were high school sweethearts. And then we went to the same college. We got engaged our senior year. And we got married in June, right after we graduated. You smiled. And it all started with a good conversation at lunch, like you had today. So you never know. Slow down, old man, Millie said, fighting off a smile. Grandpa's eyes went soft and misty. I'm just reminiscing. I wish I could. I wish you could have met your grandma, Millie. She was really something special and to lose her when she wasn't even 40. It's like Annabelle Lee, Millie said. The Poe poem? Grandpa asked. It was many and many years ago, the kingdom by the sea. Yes, I guess it was something like that. You know Poe? Millie asked. And it was weird to hear him recite one of her favorite poems. Grandpa was a math person. She didn't expect him to know anything about poetry. Believe it or not, I'm a pretty good literate old dude. I like Poe and a lot of other writers too. I know you like Poe because he's dark and spooky and it's easy to romanticize about death when you're so young and it's so far away. But Poe didn't write about death because he thought it was romantic. 
He wrote about it because he had lost so many people he loved. You've never experienced that kind of loss, Millie. It changes you. People ain't hard. You know, for years after she died, kids were always trying to fix me up with other women, but it never works. She was the only one for me. Millie had never really thought about Grandpa's feelings before. How he must have felt when Grandma got sick and died. How lonely he must have been after years after she was gone. How he might still be lonely now. It must have been hard, she said. Losing Grandma. Grandpa nodded. It was. I still miss her every day. Well, thanks for dinner, Millie said. I guess I'd better get started on my homework. Without being asked, Grandpa said, smiling. This is certainly a special day. In her room, Millie didn't think of death. She thought of Dylan and thought about what Grandpa had said about Grandma. And she recited Annabelle Lee in her head this time. It seemed like a poem about love instead of a poem about death. Silly Millie, for someone who doesn't like to die, you should spend a lot of time talking about it. The voice surrounding her said, But that's the way of things, isn't it? Talk is always easier than action. I think, Millie said, sniffling, that when I said I wanted to die, what I really wanted was to escape. I didn't want death. I just wanted my life to be different. Oh, but that really takes action, doesn't it? The voice said. Changing life for the better, especially when the world is such a mean... Rotten place? It's much easier to ultimately, more satisfying, to snuff it out! Which brings me to my second set of options. Much more interesting ones. These are quick and easy for you, for the most part. But they require a little more effort from me. I'm not complaining, though. There's nothing I like more than a good challenge to relieve my boredom. Say, like Dracula, don't you? M Millie could barely find her voice to answer. Why? Are you gonna bite me on the neck? Now, how would I do that? With you inside my belly, silly girl. I know that you like Dracula. The kids at school call you Dracula's daughter, don't they? Well, what you might not know is that the character of Dracula was inspired by a real person. A prince named Vlad Dracula. But he's better known for his vice nickname. Vlad the Impaler! Millie's insides seemed to turn to jelly. Vlad kills thousands of his enemies! But his crabbing achievement was creating a force of impaled, where thousands of his victims, men, women, and children, were skewered to stakes driven into the ground! Now, I know Prince. And I can't aspire to that level of achievement. But one little old impaler can't be that hard, can't it? I can just take out a me one of my metal rods and drive it through my body cavity. And it'll go straight through you. And out the other side. If the spike goes through your vital organs, that comes quickly. If it doesn't... There can be some hours of bleeding and suffering. 
and people who walked through the forest of the Imperial talked about the moaning and gasping of the victims. So, impaling, one might say other deaths, impale in comparison. Voice's tone was cheery. It can run quickly, or slowly, but the result is the same in the end. Like I said, win-win! No! Millie whispered. She, she wanted her mom and dad. She wanted her grandpa. They would help her if they only knew. She'd even settle for Goofy Uncle Rob and Aunt Sherry as long as they would come to her rescue. She would even put on a Christmas sweater if that made them happy. Millie sat at her table in the cafeteria, expectantly. She had taken special care with her appearance this morning, choosing a lacy black top and jet Victorian warning necklace from her small collection. Her face powder enhanced her blur, and her black eyeliner had the perfect cat-like effect. As minutes passed, she started to worry. What if Dylan didn't show up? What if he and she had gotten all dressed up for nothing? What if, as she'd always suspected, life offered no possibility of pleasure or happiness? But then, there he was, with his leather jacket and fire engine red hair and shiny silver earrings. Hey, Millie said, trying not to sound like she was too happy to see him. Hey, he said, setting his tray on the table and sitting across from her. I brought you something. Millie's heart pounded in excitement. She hoped she didn't show it. He reached into his pocket of his leather jacket and pulled out a worn paperback book. H.P. Lovecraft, he said. I was telling you about him yesterday. I remember, Millie said, taking the book. The Call of the Cthulhu and other stories. Did I say that right? Cthulhu? Who knows, Dylan said. H.P. Lovecraft made it up. And he's dead, so we can't ask him. You can keep the book. I got a copy in hardcover for my birthday, he grins. My parents are cool. They don't mind that I like weird stuff. Thanks. She felt a little smile creeping up on her face. She slipped the book into her bag. She would, she would certainly read the book. But it wasn't the book itself that was making her all smiley. It was that the Dylan had thought of her while he was at home. Not in her presence, he had thought of her, found the book, put it in his jacket pocket, and remembered to give it to her. In her experience, boys weren't usually this thoughtful. No pity. I always think impaling has a certain dramatic flair. Perhaps something with a little more zing. Electrocution is always an effective option. Did you know that the idea of the electric chair was developed in the 1800s by a dentist named Alfred P. Southwick? He came up with the idea of an electric chair based on a dental chair. That's not exactly comforting to people with dental phobias, now is it? I don't have a chair to strap you into, but I do have the power to shoot a series of a strong electrical currents. I don't have a chair to strap you into, but I do have the power to shoot a series of strong electrical currents through my body cavity. If the current zaps your heart or brain, you'll die quickly. If it doesn't, you'll have some nasty burns 
and your heart will go to fibrillation, which will generally kill you if you don't have help. And I think we've already established that you have don't have anyone here to help you. Help was a word Millie wanted desperately to scream. But she knew it was a waste of energy. Energy she needed to conserve if she had any hope of survival. So, what do you think, Cat Cake? Electrocution? You'd be shocked at how effective it is. An electrifyingly good time! Another chuckle. Millie! had once experienced the shock of unplugging a hairdryer from a wall socket in a badly wired hotel room. She had felt the electricity tear painfully up her arm and for a few moments was out of breath as if someone punched her in the stomach. She didn't want to think about how an electric current strong enough to kill her would feel. Good time for you, but not one for me she said. On Saturday afternoon, when most other kids were at the mall or the movies or hanging out at one another's houses, Millie walked downtown to the public library. It was about a 20 minute walk. So the walk there and back with an hour or two of browsing and reading sandwiched in between was a pleasant way to spend a Saturday afternoon in solitude. Today, she roamed the library's stacks looking for suitably dark reading material. She had finished The Call of Cthulhu and, dis and was disappointed that there wasn't any more books by Lovecraft on the shelves. Hey! Voice called behind her. She gasped and jumped, but then she saw it was Dylan. I, I didn't mean to startle you, he said. Hey, did you read the Lovecraft book? Millie couldn't believe that the stars had aligned, such she had to run into Dylan outside of the school. Yes, I loved it. I was kind of hoping they'd have more stuff by him here. Hmm, Dylan said. I bet I can pick something else you'd like. Give me a sec. With a thoughtful expression, he scanned the shelves, and then pulled out a thin book with a black cover and handled it to her. The Lottery and Other Stories by Shirley Jackson, she read. Yep, you'll love her. It's the perfect book to continue your classic horror pursuits. Hey, he said. I was reading at the other table over there until I saw you. If you want to sit there and read, too, you can. Okay. Millie worked hard not to show how happy this invitation made her. I've got to admit, I've got an ulterior motive inviting you, Dylan said. I want to see the look on your face once you finish reading that first story in that book. They sat at a table across from each other and read in companionable silence. Millie really loved talking with Dylan, but being quiet with him was nice too. She read The Lottery with a growing feeling of suspense. And when she got to the ending, Dylan laughed. You're reading with your mouth hanging open, he said. It's the ultimate surprise ending, isn't it? It really is. Say, Dylan said. I was thinking that after I check out my books, I might have a cup of tea at the cafe next door. Would you like to do that, too? I mean, you don't have to drink tea just because I do. You can have coffee or hot chocolate. Tea sounds nice, Millie said. This afternoon was turning out to be nice. Surprisingly so. Millie had passed you and me coffee and tea hundreds of times, but had never gone inside. It was a pleasant surprise with an expo exposed brick walls displaying paintings by local artists. Sitting with Dylan over the st their steaming cups, Millie said, I think I might have to be a... 
Millie said, I think I might like to be a librarian someday. She had never told anyone this before. She'd always been afraid of getting laughed at. That'd be cool, Dylan said. You love books. I love books. I love being quiet, Millie said, sipping her Earl Grey tea. You should totally dress in a goth librarian style too, Dylan said. You could put your hair up and wear your jet jewelry and black Victorian dress and those old fashioned glasses that just clip onto your nose. What are they called? Snez? Dylan grinned. Yeah, those. And when you dress like that and shush people in the library, it'll scare the living daylights out of them. Millie laughed and she had to admit it felt good. It's for better when she knowed she'd had lunch with Dylan. She could spend the morning looking forward to seeing him and the afternoon thinking about what they'd said at, to each other at lunch. Sometimes she felt a little silly for spending too much time thinking about a boy, but Dylan wasn't just some ordinary boy. Today, when she got home from school, her grandpa met her in a cluttered living room. I thought we might have a school holiday blazer today, he said. Instead of his usual cardigan, he was wearing an ugly green pullover sweater, decorated with creepy smiling Christmas trees. The holiday blazer is stupid, Millie rolled her eyes. Just a bunch of people selling ugly Christmas tree ornaments made out of popsicle sticks. Oh, I always thought the baser was kind of fun when I was a teacher. This year, there's a chili supper, and you can choose between meat and vegetarian chili. And there's a, an all-you-can-eat cookie buffet. Think about those two words for a minute, Millie. He paused dramatically. All-you-can-eat cookie buffet. You've really done your homework on this, haven't you? Millie said. He would, he would never say it out loud, but it was kind of cute how excited Grandpa was. I have. I take cookies very seriously. I can see that. Millie sighed. Maybe just this time she could let this old man have something he wanted. The two of them didn't get out much either, and it might be good for him to be among other people. Okay, I guess I'll go, even if it's not my thing. Great, Grandpa said. We'll leave in about an hour. He looked, he looked up and down. Maybe you could wear something besides black? Something, you know, a little more festive? Don't push it, Grandpa. Millie said. She couldn't believe she agreed to attend such a lame event, but maybe Dylan would be there. Under duress, like her. And they could make fun of it together. The school halls were sparkly with Christmas lights, and Millie had been correct about predicting the ugliness of the ornaments for sale. But the vegetarian chili was tasty and there was an impressive variety of cookies on the cookie buffet, including gingerbread, which was her favorite. After she and Grandpa ate their fill, she wandered the hallways giving the impression of looking at the craft displays, but she was really looking for Dylan. She found him in the second floor hallway, but not in the way she wanted to. Dylan was standing in front of a booth selling reindeer Christmas ornaments made out of candy canes, but he wasn't alone. He was with Brooke Harrison, a blandly pretty blonde girl who was in Millie's U.S. government class. Dylan and Brooke were holding hands, laughing about some private joke in a very couple-ish way. Millie bit her lip, 
to keep it from gasping, turned around and ran through the hall down the stairs. She had to find Grandpa. She had to get out of there. Where's the fire, Dracula's daughter? Some random kid asked her. She didn't even bother to process who it was. They were all the same anyways. She ran into the cafeteria scanning the crowd for Grandpa's ugly Christmas sweater. Unfortunately, a lot of people were wearing ugly Christmas sweaters. She finally found Grandpa next to the drinks table, sipping coffee and chatting a to a couple of other old men who were also retired teachers. These guys apparently shopped at the same ugly Christmas sweater as Stora's grandpa. We have to go, Millie pissed at him. Grandpa knitted his brow in concern. You sick or something? No, I just have to go. Why wouldn't he move faster? Okay, honey. He gave the other old guys that look that seemed to say, They're so emotional at this age. And then said, See you later. Merry Christmas. In the car, Grandpa said, What's the matter, honey? Did somebody at school say something that hurt your feelings? Millie really couldn't believe her grandpa could be so stupid. Nobody at school said anything to me because nobody at school ever says anything to me. Nobody at the school cares if I live or die. See, she stifled a sob and wiped under her eyes to try to stop the flow of tears. I remember that feeling that way when I was your age. I couldn't go back to being 14 for anything. Not even with all the years I'd get back. The tears weren't stopping. Millie looked out the window and tried to ignore Grandpa. He couldn't possibly understand. Nobody could understand. Especially people who got excited about Christmas sweaters and cookies and that fake happy stuff that filled their minds with to ward off their fear of death. Millie wasn't afraid of death. Right now, Death felt like her only friend. Hi! We certainly are picky, aren't we? The voice said. Somebody who wants the end result. We are awfully fussy about how to achieve it. But there are lots of more options. I feel like a waiter. Talking my way through the menu of at a fancy restaurant. The difference, of course, is that one menu gets you fed, and the other gets you dead. Low rumbling laughter. Oh, I crack myself up! Hmm, since I was talking about food, how about boiling? Did you know Henry VI that made boiling alive and is the official form of punishment during his reign? Why they call it boiling alive? Because goodness knows you don't stay alive for very long. But I could easily flood my insides with water. Then use my energy stores to bring it the temperature up, up, up. First it would feel nice and warm, like a bath, but then it would keep getting hotter, and hotter, and hotter! And I wonder if you turn red like a lobster! Millie sat miserably at her table in the cafeteria, knowing that she was doomed so long. She, op she opened an anthology of horror stories she had checked out from the library, Books, at least, would always keep her company. But then Dylan sat down across from her, acting like absolutely nothing was wrong. Hey, he said. How can you sit across from me like that? Millie said. He was so casual, opening up his ketchup packets and 
creating a little red puddle on his plate, just like always. Like what? Dylan said, looking lost. I sit here every day. I would think you'd want to sit with Brooke, Millie said. Brooke has a different lunch period than me. He obviously dipped a nugget into his ketchup puddle and popped it into his mouth. Millie felt anger rising up all the way from her toes. So I'm what? Your backup? Your understudy? Dylan rubbed his face like he was tired. I'm sorry, Millie. I, I'm keep trying to keep up. I really am. But you're not making any sense. Millie couldn't understand how he could be so stupid. Dylan, I saw you with her at the bazaar last night. Yeah, so? She's, she had never felt so exasperated. You were holding hands. You were clearly together. Yeah, so? He repeated, but then a look of realization dawned on his face. Wait, Millie. Did you think you and I were dating? Millie, Millie swallowed hard and told herself not to cry. You noticed me, bought me a book, took me out for tea. Of course I thought we might eat in the future date, I mean. Wow, Dylan said. I'm sorry if I misled you. I mean, you're really great and really pretty and everything, but I never meant to make it think that you and I were anything other than friends. Haven't you ever had a friend who's a boy, but who's not, you know, a boyfriend? Hannah had been Millie's only friend, but had abandoned her. There was no way Millie was sharing this fact with Dylan. Of course I have. But Dylan, you told me I was the only cool person you'd met at the school. I did, but that was my first day. I've met other cool people since then. Like Brooke? Millie's voice dripped with sarcasm. What, you don't approve of Brooke? Dylan said, she's so blonde and basic. Millie said, no need to mince words. The truth was the truth. <laughs> Have you ever had a conversation with her? Dylan asked. Do you even know what she's like? Millie, had it Millie ever heard Brooke say anything? She was quite quiet in her US government class. Millie assumed because she had nothing interesting or important to say. I've never talked to her, Millie said. I don't talk to just anyone. Brooke. Dylan shook his head. Well, Brooke isn't just anyone. She's smart and well-read and nice. She wants to be a veterinarian. Why does it matter what color her hair is? Dylan looked at her so hard, it was like she, he was looking through her. Millie. I'm disappointed in you. You, of all people with your black wardrobe and black eyeliner and black nail polish, it seems like you means you'd know better than to judge a person based on her appearance. You don't like it when people do it to you, and you're, you're guilty at the very same time. I'm pretty sure that's called hypocrisy. He stood up. This conversation is over. As the winter holidays approached, Millie's mood became grimmer and grimmer. The cold temperatures and the gray skies and the stripped bare trees all matched her emotional state perfectly. Cheerful holiday lights and plastic Santas on people's houses filled her with anger. And the sound of Christmas carols in stores and other public places enraged her. She felt that she couldn't be held responsible for her actions if she had to hear Winter Wonderland one more time. 
All they'd cheer, peace on earth, and goodwill were just lies people told themselves. Winter was the season of death. At dinner, vegetable stir-fry for Millie, chicken vegetable stir-fry from Grandpa. Grandpa said, So, you are excited that tomorrow's the last day before winter break? Not really, Millie said. Listen, I've been meaning to tell you, I'm not celebrating Christmas this year. Grandpa's face fell. Not celebrating Christmas? But why ever not? Millie poked at a piece of broccoli and with her fork. I refuse to be happy on some particular day, and just because society tells me I'm supposed to. It's not about society. It's about family, Grandpa said. It's about getting together and enjoying each other's company. On Christmas Eve, your aunt and uncle and cousins are coming over, and your mom and dad are going to Skype in so they can be part of things. We'll have a big dinner and exchange gifts, and then we'll have a hot chocolate and cookies and board games. Millie felt nauseous at the thought of all the, that false cheer. I'll be here because I don't have any place else to go, but I refuse to participate in the festivities. Is that fact? Grandpa said. He pushed his plate away. Listen, Millie, you've never been particularly cheerful as a child. Heaven knows you were the fussiest baby I've ever seen. And when you were a toddler, your temper tantrums were legendary. But I feel like you're especially unhappy here with me now, and I'm genuinely sorry for that. I'm an old man, and I'm no expert in what young girls are like. But I've tried to make things as nice for you as I can. Maybe, maybe it would have been better if you'd chosen to move abroad with your mom and dad. I know it might be hard to be so far away from them. I don't miss my parents, Millie shouted. But even as she said it, she wasn't sure if it was true. Surely they made her crazy sometimes when they were together. But it was weird having them so far away, and Skyping with them on Sunday nights wasn't nearly enough to make up for them being absent from her everyday life. It didn't help that she tended to be in a bad mood during their Skype sessions, mad at them for being gone, and so conversations weren't always pleasant. Okay, maybe you don't, Grandpa said. But something's been eating you lately. Maybe a problem at school, or a falling out with a friend. I'm not saying I could help, but sometimes it helps to have someone to listen. Against her will, a picture of Dylan popped up in her head. Dylan the first day she met him, when she couldn't believe this cool new guy who couldn't, uh, could have sat anywhere he wanted to in the cafeteria, chose to sit right across from her. Well, that never happened anymore. Now he sat at the table with those guys who never talked about anything but fantasy role-playing games. And Millie sat alone with a book for company. I told you, I don't have any friends, Millie said. Oh, maybe you should try to make one, Grandpa said. You don't have you don't have to be a social butterfly if you don't want to be. But everyone needs a good friend. You don't know what I need. Millie stood up from the table. I'm going to do my homework. She didn't really have homework since tomorrow was the last day before break. But she'd say everything she'd had to say to get out of there. And I'm going to my workshop, Grandpa said. You're not the only one who can storm out of a room, you know, girly. It was the first time since she had moved in with Grandpa that he sounded like he was actually mad at her. 
In her room, Millie opened her laptop and went to YouTube and typed out Kurt Harrison music videos. She clicked on Death Mask, her favorite song. The video was filled with images of ravens and bats circling vultures, and in the center of it all, Kurt Harrison himself growling his way through the morbid lyrics. His black hair spiky, his complexion pallid, his black eyeliner perfectly applied. Millie felt like Kurt Harrison might be the one person on the planet who would understand her. Who was she kidding? Nobody would. Please don't boil me, Millie said. She had to figure out a way to escape. Suddenly, desperately, she wanted to live. Not boiling? Well, understandable. By all accounts, it was a very nasty way to go. People who observed boiling during had like the sexist time said it was so sickening. They would have rather have seen a beheading. Oh! That's a good one! We haven't talked about it yet! Decapitation! He said it as it was such a happy word. There are many ways to chop off a head, of course. And the lane is sharp enough. It's fairly quick and painless. That being said, if the blade isn't sharp enough, well, poor Mary Queen of Scots had to get three hacks for the hacksman's dull old axe before her knocking was liberated from her body. The guillotine was quick and clean, though didn't require any particular skill on the part of the executioner, which made it very easy to get rid of all those rich snots during the French Revolution. They just lined them up and rammed them through the guillotine like an assembly line. Or rather, a disassembly line. The voice paused again to chuckle. Whatever it was, it seemed to be having a very good time at Millie's expense. Saudi Arabia, where your parents are, am I right? Still use those beheadings as their preferred form of capital punishment. They use a sword, which I find rather stylish and dramatic. Saudi Arabia? Millie thought. Her parents were so far away, so unable to help her. And now she was facing down death. She strangely felt more love for them than she ever had. Sure, they were weird and they made strange decisions and stupid mistakes. But she knew them and she knew she loved them. She thought of her dad's awful jokes and of her mom reading her story after story at that time, when she was little. Maybe her parents were different from other kids' parents, but they had always taken care of her basic needs, and they had always made her feel loved and safe. Millie wanted to be safe. Millie! At least come downstairs and say hello! Grandpa called up the stairs. It was Christmas Eve, and Grandpa had been blasting Christmas music all day long, singing Silver Bells and White Christmas, and others of Millie's least favorite off-key in the kitchen, while he baked ham and decorated the cookies. From the level of noise downstairs, Millie assumed that her aunt and uncle and cousins had arrived. This fact did not fill her with joy. Nothing did. Millie reluctantly dragged herself downstairs. They were gathered around an antique glass punch bowl that Grandpa had dug out from who knows where in this house, full of stuff. They were wearing Christmas sweaters, all of them, even her annoying little cousins. Aunt Sherry had one of those wearable abominations with a reindeer that had light-up nose. Uncle Rob 
her dad's goofy brother wore a red sweater with candy canes on it, and Cameron Hayden wore matching elf sweaters. It was all so hideous that Millie feared her eyes would bleed. Merry Christmas! Aunt Sherry greeted her, opening her arms for a hug. Millie did not move toward her. Hello, she said, her voice dripping icicles. Off to the funeral, Millie, Uncle Rob said, running toward her head-to-toe black and purple clothing. He always said this to her and apparently never stopped finding it hilarious. I wish, Millie said. Better to be in an honest and sad environment than make a fake happy one. And she would certainly prefer funeral organ music to being forced to listen to Winter Wonderland again. Millie isn't celebrating Christmas this year, Grandpa said. But at least she agreed to grace us with her presence. How can you not celebrate Christmas? Hayden said, looking at Millie with big, innocent blue eyes. Christmas is awesome! He had a little lisp that came out when he said Christmas and awesome. Millie supposed some people would find cute. And presents are awesome! Cameron said, pumping his fist in excitement. Both kids were so hyper. It was like their parents had poured them full of black coffee. Millie really wondered if there had been a time when they got this excited over a holiday or whether she was always known better. Our culture is already too materialistic, Millie said. Why do you want more stuff? Her aunt and uncle and cousins looked at her uncomfortably. Good. Somebody in this family needed to tell the truth. Sherry plastered a smile on her face. Millie, won't you at least have a cup of eggnog? Drinking eggnog is drinking is like drinking felgen, Millie said. Really how really how had such a disgusting beverage become a part of any traditional celebration? Eggnog and fruitcake both seemed more like they would be a part of a punishment rather than a celebration. What's plaguing them? He even asked. It's that gross, slimy stuff in your throat and nose when you have a cold, Aunt Shara said. Cameron raised his cup. Young! Egg snot! He then said and took a big, showy drink that left an eggy mustache on his upper lip. Millie couldn't take it. She had to get out of there. I'm going for a walk, she said. Can we come too? Hayden asked. No, Millie said. I need to be alone. Well, don't stray too far, Grandpa said. We're eating dinner in an hour. As Millie headed out the door, Grandpa called for her to remember her coat, but she ignored him. All the houses in the neighborhood had extra cars in their driveways, no doubt because of visiting family members celebrating the holiday. All these people acting the same, doing the same thing, presents and eggnog and hypocrisy. Well, Millie was different and she wasn't going to participate. Hypocrisy. She thought again, and this time the word stung her. Dylan had said that she was a hypocrite because she judged her by her appearance. But boys, even boys who seemed cool like Dylan, were fooled by appearances. If a conventionally pretty blonde girl paid any attention to them, they'd think she was a saint and a genius rolled into one. No way was Millie a hypocrite. She was a truth teller, and if people couldn't handle the truth, that was their problem. After one lap around the block, she was feeling pretty cold, but there was no way she was going back in the house yet. 
An idea popped into her head. Grandpa's workshop had a little space heater he always kept running. It could keep her toasty and warm for a while. She waited. It could keep her toasty, warm while she waited out the party. He, w he was too busy hosting his lame little holiday gathering and to go to, to his workshop. He was too busy hosting his lame little holiday gathering to g go into his workshop. It was a perfect place to hide. Grandpa kept a key under the flower pot beside the workshop door. Millie found it, opened the door, and pulled the chain on the bare light bulb that lit the small windowless space. She closed the door behind her and looked around. The place was even more crammed with stuff than it had been since last time she was here. Grandpa really must have been hitting the yard sales, flea markets, and salvage yards. Near the workbench was a rusty antique bicycle, the kind with a giant front wheel and a tiny back one. There were lots of old mechanical toys too. A metal bank with a crown that flipped in coins into its mouth. A jack-in-the-box that startled her when the jester doll inside jumped out. Even though she'd known what would happen once she started turning the crank. There were, was even one of those horrible grinning monkey dolls that claimed symbols together. Why did Grandpa want all this stuff? And what did he plan to do with it? Repair it and then use it? to clutter his house some more, she guessed. The strangest item among many was tucked into a corner of the workshop. It was some kind of mechanical bear with a bow tie, top hat, and a creepy black grin. It looks like it had once been white and pink, but years of neglect had left it dingy gray. It was big, Big enough for a person to climb inside his potty cavity. Like in those science fiction movies, people drove giant robots. The hinges on its limbs made it look as if the parts had once moved. It must have been a figure from one of those old kids' attractions that featured creepy booking animatronics. Why had little kids ever liked things that were so nightmare inducing? From outside the workshop, Millie heard laughter and yelling. Hayden and Cameron playing in the backyard. She hadn't thought to lock up the workshop door from the inside. What if they tried to come in? She couldn't let them find her. They'd go tell the adults and then she'd be dragged back into the party and sentenced to this mandatory celebration. Millie found herself staring at the old animatronic bear, not just a curiosity now, but a potential solution to her problem. She opened the door to the mechanical bear's body cavity, crawled inside, and shut the door. Darkness enveloped around her. It was so much better than those annoyingly twinkly lights and garish bright Christmas sweaters. This was perfect. No one would find her here. She could go back to the house after she heard Uncle Rob and Aunt Sherry his cars pulling out of the driveway. So what if she missed sky paying with her parents? It served them right for being so far away from her on Christmas. Kids, time for Christmas dinner. Grandpa called out the back door. Billy, you coming too, if you can hear me. Cameron and Hayden came in running, her cheeks pink from the chilly air. It smells great in there, Cameron said. Well, that's because I cooked you a feast, Grandpa said. Ham and sweet potatoes and rolls and your mom's green bean casserole. You boys didn't happen to see Millie while you were out there, did you? Nope, didn't see her, Aiden said. Grandpa, why is she so weird? 
Grandpa chuckled. She's 14. You'll be weird when you're 14, too. Now go wash your hands before you sit down and eat. At the table, Grandpa carved a big, sticky, and beautiful hand. I glazed this thing with Coca-Cola, he said. Found the recipe on the internet. I've been looking up a lot of recipes since Millie moved in. Most of them vegetarian, so she don't won't starve herself to death. I bought this weird, fake turkey loaf thing for her at the grocery store. When she gets back, she can have it with the green bean casserole and sweet potatoes. I keep feeling like we ought to go out and look for her, Sherry said. Oh, she'll show up when she gets hungry or when she feels like she's made her point, Grandpa said. She and that cat of hers her aren't that different. She's just that age, you know. Now, speaking of hungry, who wants some ham? I don't have a sword like a Saudi Arabia executioner. <laughs> Silly Millie, the voice said. But I do have a sharp sheet of metal that I can pass through the chamber. I can pass at the level of your throat. Or I can hit your lower bicep. And bisection is a sure way to go. Either way, the job would get done. I think it would be smooth like a mundane guillotine instead of a slow, dull hacking like Mary Queen of Scots experienced. But I'm not one to hew. I'm not one to hew dread a person, sure. This will be my first attempt at a gay competition. Yours, too. But it will also be last. As the voice laughed at its latest witticism, Millie pushed on the walls of the chamber that trapped her. They didn't budge, but then she saw a tiny crack of light shining through the side of the door. Maybe if she could slip something, a tool of some sort, into that crack, she could somehow pry the door open. But what could she use as a tool? She took a mental survey of her jewelry. Her earrings were too small and breakable. Her necklace was an unhelpful string of jet beads. But there was a silver cuff bracelet on her wrist. She pulled it off and pushed it and bent it until it was nearly ruler straight. The end seemed like the right size to slip into the crack in the door. But she was too afraid to test it, too worried that her captor would notice. Millie, the voice said, are you still with me? A decision must be made. Millie thought if she lowered her head and curled up into a little ball when the blade shot through, it would miss her. And she'd have to be quick, though, and make sure she got her whole head out of the way or else she'd be scalped. If the blade came through the lower to bisect her, she'd really have to flatten out to in the bottom of the small space. Is there any chance you could just let me go? She asked. Anything I could give you in exchange for my life? Let John. There's nothing I want from you except your life. Millie took a deep breath. Okay. Then decapitation it is. Really? The voice sounded tremendously pleased. Good choice. It's a classic. I promise you won't be disappointed. The low rumbling laugh. You won't be disappointed. Because you'll be dead. Millie felt more tears spring into her eyes. She had to be strong, but you could still cry and be strong at the same time. Tell me when you're about to do it, okay? Don't just spring it on me. Fair enough. I suppose it's not like you're going anywhere. Give me a few minutes and get ready. You know what they say? 
Cry at preparation prevents a frog performance. The chamber shook and rattled. The animatronic's eyes rolled back outward, away from the chamber. Millie waited, her heart pounding. Why had she ever wished for death? No matter how hard life could be, how depressing or disappointing, she wanted to live. If nothing else, she wanted to, a chance to apologize to Dylan for what she'd said about Brooke and ask if they could be friends again. She curled into a tiny ball, as she could, tucking her head under her arms. She hoped harder that she could. She curled into as tiny as a ball as she could, tucking her head under her arms. She hoped harder than she'd ever hoped for anything. She was low enough to miss the blade. Millicent Fitzsimmons, you are here by seconds to death. Crimes of humanity! Wait, Millie said. What does that mean? Crimes of humanity? You, the voice said, have been rude and quick to anger, who have rushed the judgment of others, and have been insufficiently grateful to those who have shown you nothing but love and kindness. The voice was right. Different instances of her own rudeness and ingratitude played in her head like scenes from a movie she didn't want to see. Guilty as charged, Millie said. But why are those crimes I have to die for? Those are crimes that everyone makes. True, the voice said. That's why the crimes of humanity. But if there's something all humans are guilty of, then why do I have to die for them? The voice didn't answer, and Millie felt a small tingle of hope. Maybe she wouldn't have to take her chances by curling up on the floor of the cavity. Maybe she could talk herself out of it. Because, the voice said, You're the one who crawled inside my belly. Whimpering, Millie made herself as small as she possibly could in the bottom of the cavity. If she got out, she was going to make it a point to be nicer to Grandpa. He really had been good to her, taking her in and putting up with her moods and teaching himself how to cook all those vegetarian recipes. In the spirit of the French Revolution, the voice said, I will now do a countdown in French before releasing the blade. One, do it, kill us. Grandpa brought out a platter of sugar cookies and set them on a coffee table. I'll be right back with the hot chocolate, he said. In the kitchen, he finally broke down and called Millie's cell number. Her phone rang, but it was from the pocket of her jacket.
I hope you all enjoyed today's story, as our next story will be Dance With Me, as read by Kim JJ, Saint of Germain. This has been Ultra of Taro Productions, and it is now four days until the party. Farewell, my friends.